Hello, are we audible? Hello, hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Amit here from main building. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Majumdas. Hi, hi, hi uh, Sanjeev. How are you? I'm fine, fine. Good. Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks. Hello, ma'am. Hi. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. On behalf of PhD Student Scientific Community at CSI MTech, I'm Madhulata. And I'm Nishtha Chandal. Welcome you all to the lecture series SOROS 2022. The student organized lectures on science that is SOROS is a scientific seminar series conducted monthly by the PhD student community at CSI MTech. The series aims at bringing eminent scientists and budding researchers on a single platform and is envisioned to provide, is envisioned to provide the students to connect and interact with the renowned scientists and researchers across the globe. Each and hour long session features a lecture by an eminent speaker followed by an interactive question and answer session. We are very excited to have with us today an eminent biotech entrepreneur and global business researcher, Ms. Kiran Machumda Shaw, as our speaker. Now we request Dr. Sanjeev Khosla, Director of CSI Intech, to introduce the speaker. Sir, yeah, a uh, 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 very welcome uh, to Dr. Majumdar. It's really an honor to have you here in this seminar series. Uh, uh, it, it would have been great if uh, in non-COVID times you could have been with us. Uh, uh, and I'm actually, uh, I would really like once the COVID restrictions go and uh, we can travel uh, freely, uh, I would really request you to come to Imtech uh, 
to uh, see our uh, uh, research capabilities and we can discuss where we could actually collaborate, uh, our institutions could collaborate together. And um, uh, today, uh, I'm not going to come in between you and the students. They are really looking forward to your talk. And I'm also very eager to listen to what you have to say today. So uh, I, I'll hand it back to the students uh, and uh, it's between you students and the uh, audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Khosla. Now, now I would like to introduce today's speaker. We all know Ms. Kiran Majumdar Shah uh, as a pioneer of the biotechnology industry in India and the founder of country's leading biotechnology enterprise, Biogrip. She is a healthcare visionary and a global influencer and has been named among Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. Pierce Biotech's world's 25 most influential people in biopharma, Forbes Magazine's world's 100 most powerful women, and Fortune's top 25 most powerful women in Asia Pacific. Ms. Majumdar Shah is a passionate philanthropist, and the impact she has made as a leading woman in science has made her role a role model globally. She is committed to equitable access to healthcare through affordable innovation as she pursues a path of making a difference to billions of lives globally. During COVID, she has been championing the cause of healthcare industry in finding innovative solutions to combat the pandemic. Ms. Majumda Shah has been awarded with the EY World Entrepreneur of the Year 2020 award, which is a testimony to her entrepreneurial journey of over four decades. Her achievements have been recognized with the Lifetime Achievement Award for Outstanding Achievement in Healthcare by the Indian Council of Medical Research, New Delhi. Ma'am, we are deeply honored to have you here today. We request you to take the stage and deliver your lecture. Thank you, dear students, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Khosla, for inviting me uh, to, to participate in this uh, very, very interactive platform with the students. And I always enjoy such lecture series, which allows me to interact with students. So I thought I'll make it exciting for students by, you know, titling my talk as ideas that lead to SUNY cons, uh, because today young people aspire for entrepreneurship and to create a wealth opportunities for themselves based on knowledge. Now, I want to start by saying that a recent debate raged over the country in terms of which city is India's startup capital, Delhi or Bangalore? And I can tell you that between when it was announced that between 29, April and December uh, 2019 and 2021, Delhi added over 5,000 recognized startups, whereas Bangalore notched up over 4,500 startups and therefore, uh, you know, gained the new title of India's new startup capital. I can tell you all the entrepreneurs in Bangalore were enraged. OK, and there was this huge heated discussion about is you know, which city is really India's startup capital. So that was a good sign that people are now beginning to fight over which city is India's startup capital. And I guess the best way we have to, you know, settle this debate about which city can qualify as the startup capital is really not about the number of startups, but the value that these startups command. And so therefore, in Bangalore, we settled the, deba the debate by saying that we have the largest number of unicorns in the country and perhaps the largest number of Sunicorns, which is soon to be unicorns. Uh, Bangalore is home to 34 unicorns, making up 40% of India's share. So it is the undisputed, uh, at least unicorn capital of the country. Uh, and of these 25, have emerged between April 29 and December 2021. Now, Bangalore startups not only command more than 55% of India's unicorn valuation, by the way, but 
is also home to three of the India's four decacorns. So as you know, a unicorn is a company that has a valuation of over a billion dollars. And a decacorn is one that has a valuation of $10 billion. So you can see why Bangalore is so enraged about being overtaken by Delhi, which does not command the same kind of, uh, you know, value uh, capture that Indian, uh, that Bangalore's startups command. But having said that, I really believe that just debating which city deserves the status of India's startup capital is not going to be very productive. In fact, uh, during this debate, Dr. Mr. Mohandas Pai has rightly pointed out that we need to understand how many of these startups will grow and get funded. So it's not enough just to be a startup. He actually pointed out that out of 60,000 plus startups registered in India, only 12,000 of them got funded. Okay. Also, uh, Infosys co-founder S. Gopalakrishnan pointed out that a concentration of startups around either NCR or Bangalore is not enough. We need to have startups all over the country if we are to realize the true potential of India's entrepreneurial energy. The debate that we should be having is what are the ideas that can lead to the creation of a Sunicorn? That is the essence of my talk today. So Sunicorns or soon to be unicorns are the handful of highly valued startups that have successfully grown to attract valuations of over a few hundred million dollars. And it is just a matter of time before they will join the elite list of unicorns. So how do you create a, a Sunicorn? The trick to create a Sunicorn in my uh, view is not to chase a me too idea. You can create a Sunicorn by fighting with the competition for an existing market share. Creating a Sunicorn is about something radically different from what everyone else is doing. Creating a Sunicorn is about addressing a niche that someone has not thought about. Creating a Sunicorn is about coming up with an idea that has the potential to transform the status quo. Creating a Sunicorn is about capturing people's imagination and providing inspiration. Creating a Sunicorn is about giving them more than what they dreamed was possible. And of course, Startups that become Sunicorns are the ones that are able to improve concepts and clearly understand the challenges and opportunities of an idea. Creating a Sunicorn is simultaneously an art and a science, but it's science that generates the value behind the idea. So let me just, you know, explain this in, in, in a simpler way, saying that a Sunicorn is about an idea that is either way ahead of its time or a different idea or a better idea. So I think when you're trying to come up with a new idea, you need to understand the status quo. You need to understand what's out there. And if you think you have a new idea or a better idea or a good idea, try and benchmark it with what's out there. So today, if you have an idea, I'm just giving an example. Say you've got a new technology of making a mask that we are all using for fighting COVID. Everyone is making a mask, but if you think you have a better idea of making a better mask, why is your idea better? Can you benchmark that idea compared to all the other masks that are out there in the market? And why do you think people will be interested in buying your mask? And will they be willing to pay a, pay a premium? And if you indeed have such a good idea of making a better mask, do you think that people will invest in your idea? So I think that's the kind of questions you need to ask yourself when you're about to get into this whole sphere of shaping an idea and taking that idea to the market. 
So let me now say all of this in context with Imtech. Okay, I think Imtech is a great institute, and Imtech, in fact, is an institute that is about applied biotechnology, because you are applying microbial technologies that can actually deliver uh, opportunities and potentially new technologies for biotechnology and for the sector. So I think this is one institute that must deliver very handsomely on you know, ideas that lead to SUNYCONS, right? So as students of IMTECH, I really believe that you are very lucky to be working and researching in the niche domain of microbial biotechnology. Why do I say this? Because microbial biotechnology is all encompassing. You learn about molecular biology, microbial genetics, cell biology and immunology, protein science and engineering, fermentation technology and applied microbiology. These are all very fundamental and foundational, as you know, to biotechnology and industrial biotechnology. Two decades ago, if you think about it, the field of microbiology was small and essentially focused on disease and bad microbes. So everyone just thought that, you know, bio, I mean, about microbiology was all about discovering and developing antibiotics for that matter. The discovery of penicillin catalyzed a large pharmaceutical sector that generated a plethora of antimicrobials. So everyone thought that microbiology is only about developing, you know, antibiotics, fermentation led antimicrobials. And if you remember, penicillin was the greatest discovery of the last century. And from that developed a lot of other classes of antimicrobials. It has now shifted focus on engineering and harnessing good and specialized microbes which has generated new molecules and even created a whole new sector of microbiomics. OK, so microbial technology has applications in a vast number of fields. So the opportunities are also very vast. From gut microbes to environmental microbiology, from medical microbiology to systems microbiology, from molecular bio microbiology and immunology to antimicrobial agents and resistance from public health microbiology to parasitology, from virology to veterinary microbiology. Today, microbiologists can do so much. And what you can do is not just vast, but there are so many exciting new discoveries and opportunities that you can all look at. And as a microbiologist, you can integrate your passion for research and entrepreneurship to find significant solutions that the world is seeking. OK, so I want to take this opportunity to share with you some examples of inspiring stories of how a SUNYCON mindset is necessary and how many such young entrepreneurs in our very country have actually built very interesting ventures in the life sciences domain. So let me give you an example. One is rich core life sciences. OK, so this was a, this is a success story of a Bangalore based startup launched in 2005 by a previous colleague of mine called Subramani Ram Chandrappa. He used to work at Biocon and he came to me and said, look, I want to really pursue an entrepreneurial journey and, you know, I'd like to join the Indian School of Business because I've learned a lot at Biocon because those were the days when he used to work in the enzymes division of the company. And he felt that he wanted to go and, you know, see whether he could create a, an entrepreneurial opportunity um, from what he had learned at Biocon. And I encouraged him to do that because we were also moving from enzymes to biopharmaceuticals at that time. So I said, well, I certainly think you should go for it if you're really interested in becoming an entrepreneur. 
So after he finished his course from ISB, he was looking for a business idea that would allow him to monetize his understanding of microbial fermentation. And it was then that he chose a very interesting niche when he realized that many pharmaceutical products required enzymatic biotransformation. And as many of these enzymes were not available in India, he decided to produce these enzymes as an entrepreneurial opportunity. So he came to me and said, look, I want to develop biotransformation enzymes. And since you have started developing insulin, I know that you need uh, a recombinant trypsin um, and many other enzymes that are required for insulin production, peptidase, for instance. Can I start making it? So he started with recombinant trypsin because he felt it was a digestive enzyme that he could make, uh, which could be used in uh, many, many formulations. And he went into developing a number of biotransformation enzymes for insulin production. Uh, which, uh, you know, we could actually then use in our processes. So I think this was a very interesting, um, you know, niche that he that he identified and started building his company, Richcore, making these products. In the last decade and a half, Subbu, as we normally, as we affectionately call him, successfully created a business that not only had a steady revenue stream, but was also profitable. And in 2020, uh, he sold Richcore to Loras Labs at a valuation of 340 crores of $50 million. So you can see that he actually was getting into that space of being a Sunicon, and now he's part of a much larger organization. And I remember that when he started off in 2005 with some angel investments, it was valued at about 25 crores. So you can see how he has grown that 25 crores to 350 crores or $50 million or more. And that's what I'm trying to get you all excited about. That, you know, you have to come up with an idea, shape that idea and see whether it's a niche idea and grow that idea so that it becomes valuable. Another uh, successful entrepreneur who emerged from, again, Biocon's uh, stable uh, is uh, Shri Kumar Suryanarayan, who co-founded a company called C6 Energy. Okay. Shri Kumar served as president of R&D at Biocon for almost two decades. In 2010, he started C6 Energy with about $2 million raised from angel investors and with the assistance of the Department of Biotechnology. Very recently, the CNN business channel, which is uh, globally uh, you know, talked about his company and did an extensive piece on C6 Energy describing how this Indian startup could revolutionize ocean farming with its sea combine harvester. Now, C6 Energy uses its proprietary technologies to convert seaweed into environmentally friendly products for agriculture, animal health, food ingredients. And at the end of the day, his main objective is to create renewable energy from seaweed. And he has operations both in India and Indonesia. Now, he had a very ambitious plan to convert seaweed to biofuel to help India's dependence on crude oil. The company so far has raised $20 million in funding. Okay. And there is considerable interest worldwide in the potential of seaweed to mitigate climate change. And I believe that C6 Energy is well on its way to becoming a Sunicon. So this was an idea which came out of the fact that he felt seaweed had something to offer him. But he realized that seaweed farming was very manual and very, uh, you know, uh, labor intensive. And so what he decided to do was to use his engineering knowledge to come up with floating platforms to which would support seaweed grow, uh, growing on it. 
and he then came up with a seaweed combiner or a harvester that could actually harvest all this seaweed very easily and mechanically and he could then cover a much larger surface of the oceans for growing seaweeds which could not be done manually so this is an idea that has now grabbed the attention of a lot of people worldwide and it has come out from a very simple idea that was born out of the notion that we should look at seaweed rather than depend on land grown crops for biofuel so that's the idea that generated out of the fact that we have more 75% of the earth's surface is covered by water and yet we are constantly trying to find renewable energy renewable energy from biomass that is grown on on land which he felt could actually be grown on the oceans and that's how this idea evolved okay and shaped into this very interesting concept which is now grabbing the attention of the world another company which is very close to all of your area of interest is bugworks research okay so bugworks is another bangalore based startup founded by v balasubramaniam anand anand kumar and shantanu datta in 2014 and they are working on the niche field of developing novel antibiotics to treat superbugs okay they have identified the rise of antimicrobial resistance as an urgent global issue that needs to be tackled on a war footing through bug works they are trying to address the amr crisis by creating a new class of antibiotics targeting all known classes of multi drug resistant bacteria till date bugworks has raised a total of 34 million dollars in over 6 rounds of funding and i'm confident that the products they have developed and are developing will find a huge market in the years to come and they will tra traverse the journey of becoming a sunicorn and hopefully join the list of unicorns as well so you can see i've given you three examples of ideas that were germinated as small ideas but each one of them thought it was a billion dollar idea that is something which i think every one of you should understand that when you get an idea i think in your mind you should ask yourself is it a billion dollar idea and if so how are you going to make it a billion dollar idea and that is how you go on your journey of becoming a sunicorn and then a unicorn so let me now shift gears and give you an example of the tech sector and how they are doing it so there's a company called razor pay okay which is a fintech startup back in 2014 harshil mathur and shashank kumar founded razor pay in bangalore to address a market need for a simple online payment solution for startups to accept money from customers whereas other fintech players were looking at the front end which was how do you pay on a unified portal razor pay decided to focus on the back end okay at that time most payment platforms were taking application programming interfaces or apis from banks and integrating with banks by adding a front end okay as a result the technical integration was clumsy Uh, support provided by most payment gateways was terrible and online reviews were very bad having identified a need in the market for an intelligent payment and business banking solution that can simplify money movement for startups razor pay was able to grow from being a payment gateway to one of india's leading fintech organizations that addresses the entire length and breadth of the businesses money movement journey okay so razor pay focuses on securing user sensitive information by encrypting data like card and bank details it connects your bank account to the platform where you need to transfer your money it authorizes you to conduct an online transaction through different payment modes like net banking credit card debit card upi or the many online wallets that are available these days and razor pay allows businesses to securely accept process and disburse payments in 6 months of 2020 alone 
the startup added over 1 million small businesses on its platform. Their ability to create an impact are reflected in their valuations also. In fact, in October 2020, Razorpay's valuation reached $1 billion, bringing it into the coveted unicorn status. So within just six months, Razorpay's valuation tripled, trebled to $3 billion. Okay. So these are examples I'm giving you of how you increase valuation of an idea. Right now, let me start with my own journey. I think all of you will be very interested to know my own journey of Biocon. So I started Biocon in 1978 with 10,000 rupees and an idea. What was that idea? That idea was to use the science of biotechnology to make enzymes that would be disruptive in their impact. As an enzymes led biotechnology enterprise, we wanted to help companies to switch from chemical processing to enzyme processing. So our whole approach was, look, chemical processes are inefficient, they are polluting, and they are very energy inefficient. Why don't we replace them with, with, with precise enzyme technologies that are eco-friendly, non-polluting, and very efficient? And of course, we started with a simple concept of, say, you know, glucose production from starch. As you know, the old processes were very dependent on acid hydrolysis. And as you know, acid hydrolysis is a very um, inefficient process. It requires high energy, high temperature, it's corrosive. And you know that when you do this, um, you know, the, the yield of glucose that you get at the end is just a little over 90 percent, 90 to 92 percent. When you use enzyme technology to really convert starch to glucose, we found that you could do this at much lower temperatures. You could do it very efficiently and you could almost always get a 98% plus purity of the glucose at the end of the process. And so that was how we started into the enzyme technology. When I was trying to scale up, our very innovative technology, which we had called the solid state fermentation technology to develop some of these enzymes. Let me say that at that time I needed one crore of rupees. That was in 1987. And at that time it was a lot of money. OK, and there was no venture capital. All I had recourse to was debt financing. So to borrow one crore, at 14% interest per annum was a very expensive bet I was, I, was, I was playing on. And the usual financers like uh, Karnataka State Financial Corporation and Karnataka Industrial Areas Development Board were very reluctant to lend me this money because they felt it was high risk. And they said, look, this technology is not validated. It is your homegrown technology. What if it fails? then our money is at risk. And I was very depressed and, you know, saying, why can't these people believe in my technology? Why can't they believe? And those days, they didn't even respect IP. I had actually filed a few patents on this technology, but they didn't understand what the value of this patent, these patents were. It was a very fortunate meeting, an accidental meeting that I had with the then chairman of ICICI, Mr. Vagul with whom I was, you know, venting my frustration, saying, look, I've got this really cool technology. I want to scale it up. I think it's a great technology. And yet, you know, I, I can't get a loan for this from the usual uh, banks, the, the state banks. So he said, look, you know, it's very interesting. I've just started a venture fund company, and this is exactly the kind of technology I want to back. So instead of giving you a loan, I'm going to invest in you. So that was music to my ears. I never even thought people would invest in me or in my technology. And what's more, he said, look, I think you need two crores, not one crore. 
And for that, he then took a stake of 20% in Biocon in 1988 in a transaction that valued Biocon at 10 crores. Okay. Within a year, um, I forged a partnership with Unilever. And Unilever bought out ICICI's stake in Biocon at four times the value. And instantly my valuation grew to 40 crores in 1989. Then in 1998, when Unilever decided to exit biotechnology, we were able to basically buy out Unilever and do a private placement at a 100 crore valuation. And a, 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 a short while after that, one of our uh, uh, VCs actually exited uh, and sold to another VC at a 500 crore valuation. That was in 2004. And six months later, when we listed the company, I was really gobsmacked to know that we listed at a billion dollar market cap. So you can see from a 10,000 rupee start, in 1978, we grew the business in value to a billion dollars by 2004. And I showed you how at every step of the way, I kept focusing on increasing the value of the business. And I can tell you the value which jumped to 100 crores, 500 crores, four, and, and so on, was all because of the IP that we had created in the company over time. So I realized the value of IP and I want to say to every one of you and to Imtech in particular, the first thing you have to focus on is creating patents and IP because patents and IP are going to be very important in that starting point of value creation. And if you have an idea that is patented, it's much more valuable than an idea that is not patented. And I can tell you that you will reap the benefits of patented ideas much easier than if they are not. Because if it's a patented idea, it's a bankable idea. And you will see that with each round of funding, your entrepreneurial venture will generate higher and higher valuation. So I you know, today I know that many, many uh, attempts are being made to see how do you create industry academia linkages. And my view is that the first linkage has to be created by licensing a patent, licensing a patentable idea to industry. Secondly, I do believe that every academic institute must have a technology transfer division because you must have business development you must have someone who understands the value of patents you must have uh, people who understand what licensing patents is all about how do you deal with industry how do you license a patent to an industry how do you get industry to work with academia and the third thing is, I think I've, I've suggested to government saying, look, I think you need to incentivize industry to work with academia. So if you are giving a weighted tax deduction on R&D done at industrial labs, then you must give a higher weighted tax deduction on an industry academia partnership where the work done in academic labs should attract a higher weighted tax deduction. That is the way you will start creating better industry academic linkages. And then of course, you know that US has been highly successful because of the Bay-Dole Act, where researchers, scientists, and academic faculty have been allowed to create companies from patents generated at academic labs. And it is this model that will create a virtuous cycle 
of ideas coming from academic institutions, which then generate startups, or which can be directly licensed to, to a, a larger industry. And then VCs will then fund those, those startups, and then those startups can become Sunicons, and those Sunicons can become unicorns. So contrary to the perception that money is not the prime driving force, Successful entrepreneurs hugely enjoy their work and derive immense satisfaction in taking up challenges of growing their business and creating that wealth. That wealth is nothing but value creation. You know, if you say that I've created a billion dollar company, that is a huge matter of pride. It's not that you have billion dollars in your bank, but the value of the business, the value of your idea is a billion dollars, right? That's what makes you very excited. And many entrepreneurs may not succeed on the first try or the first attempt. Many more will fail than I mean, many more and many will fail more than once. But those who succeed are the ones who learn from their mistakes and have the grit to stay on the course. They are the ones who create Sunni cons. So I just want to leave you with that thought that it is about value creation. So when you have an idea, focus on the value of that idea. That value of the idea can be augmented if you come out with patents, because patents are valuable. And patents are bankable. Patents are licensable. That's the journey you need to get on. So I will leave you with those thoughts. And I hope that many of you have been inspired to start companies and to, you know, even look at patenting your ideas. And I will now take up question and answers because I think this is an interactive session and I want uh, students to ask me questions. And I hope you've, uh, you know, gleaned some, uh, you know, ideas and information from what I've said to you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your very enlightening and inspiring talk. Your, your talk provided us the glance at the business startup and academic linkage. We appreciate you for taking time from your busy schedule to be the guest speaker at our seminar. We will now have a question and answer session. We request anyone in the audience who has a question to raise your hand and we will take the questions one by one. Alternatively, you may type your question in the chat box. So we can take the questions now. You can raise your hands from the audience when building seminar hall. Anyone? Anyone who has a question, kindly raise your hand and ask a question. Yes, Kaurav sir, you, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Oh, very interesting, ma'am, very inspirational. Uh, the usual journey of the PhD student in India after we will do PhD and after that we will use it in foreign countries. I want to know your views on that. What should it do to stop this flow and uh, get this opportunity here in India only? So, you know, I started Biocon, for instance, to actually prevent and reverse the brain drain. I just felt that if you create exciting opportunities in our own country, people will not look to greener pastures overseas. And I can tell you that a num I have managed to attract so many people back from different parts of the world to come and pursue uh, their opportunities in our company. But equally, I can tell you that when you look at the tech sector in Bangalore, I can tell you that now Bangalore is a magnet for many, many entrepreneurs, and these are not just Indians, but even foreigners are now flocking to Bangalore because they feel that this is the startup city which is exciting, where we can start a company, and we are actually reversing the brain drain in a much bigger way. It's almost like mimicking what US has tried to do. US um, actually attracted a lot of talent with, with the H-1B visa and the student visas. And a large part of what America is today is because of that immigrant talent that they have brought into America. We too need to have a very diverse talent base. And I can tell you it's happening. 
you need to create those cities of the future where you attract that kind of talent where everyone is excited because of the opportunities we have and i can tell you india is today potentially a very very exciting part of the world because we can become the world's largest digital and digitally enabled marketplace in globally and if if we can focus on that when even the products we make in using microbial technologies can be so exciting because india itself can be a huge marketplace and the world then becomes a marketplace for you because you've got economies of scale that's what we've done at biocon if i can market my products and 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 provide affordable access to indian patients i can provide that to any patient in the world and that's what i've done yeah dr amit tuli you can ask your question yeah uh, good afternoon dr kiran this is dr amit from mtech chandigarh uh, a very nice talk really enjoyed it and uh, you have been an inspiration for many people including me so i have two questions for you uh, one is uh, regarding the products that we sell in india like uh, you know there is always a there is always a comparison like you know when there is a item they will say let's say a cell phone for example when you come up with a product like apple you know you don't think twice before you purchase but if a same kind of a product is made in india we think 10 times before investing so how to change that mindset because that is where the consumer base is that's my first question and my second question is uh, since uh, you know you have been inspiration for many people i want to ask this thing who's been your inspiring figure uh, uh, in your life yeah so um, you know to answer your first question i think you need to be innovative why do we want to go for apple because apple is a very innovative product right what we tend to do in india is to just be imitative we are not innovative enough we need to think out of the box that's why i said to you many many tech companies now in bangalore have come up with innovative technologies which are now grabbing the attention of people all over the world okay so that's why they are being valued so high now right now of course most of the high valuations are in the tech companies the software based companies the saas companies but i think even in biotech we need to come up with innovative molecules innovative products and i think the one good thing that has happened during covid is the finally the research ecosystem is getting formed you know vaccines were produced in india after a very long time as a proprietary vaccines and that was the first uh, signal and the first signs that india can also innovate and we need to scale it up unless we start creating large number of products which are uniquely differentiated from other global products you cannot expect everyone to say that you know why are we not buying the indian product and why are we only buying the foreign product there is a colonial hangover in fact i know that biocon itself suffers from that because we have the you know two leading novel molecules that we believe are really world beating molecules but because it has been developed in india we have this over colonial overhang saying it's an indian molecule how good can it be but we've licensed it to the us now and it is addressing some very interesting unmet medical needs and hopefully when we get approval in the us or europe it will validate the power of that molecule so i think you need to build credibility my own journey as a woman entrepreneur has been about building credibility india needs to build that credibility it is not going to be built by just thumping our chests and saying we are great we have to walk the talk we have to demonstrate we have to validate that it is innovative that we are innovation led and that we are really doing something which is world beating so that is very very important and the second thing about what inspires me or who inspires me i have been inspired by a large number of people and the people who inspire me are the ones who take risk people who have basically not taken the easy path you know and people who have fought the status quo so i can be inspired by a large number of people it is not a single person see first and foremost my late father inspired me a lot because he is the one that told me that you should go and study brewing 
And I said, why brewing? I mean, I'm a girl. Why should I study beer making? And he said, look, it's biotechnology. It's microbiology. It's fermentation science. And you will be so novel and you will be so original. Go and do it. And his words were very true. Because he made me do something which was so different. And although I never could become a brewer in my own country because they thought it wasn't a job for a woman, I started a biotech company, right? And all my fermentation knowledge came to really good use. Even today, I, I owe a lot of my fermentation skills and my fermentation knowledge to those days. Even today, a lot of people are quite surprised how I know about certain aspects of fermentation. And I said, look, it's, it's your foundation. It's your fundamentals that you don't forget. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Oh, that was an interesting answer. Now we will have our next uh, speaker. That uh, the question is from Jay Kumar. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Hello, ma'am. What was your plan B when you didn't get my money from the uh, corporate banks in uh, Karnataka? I actually had no plan B. I was determined to raise the money at any cost. Okay, so you never thought that to sell your idea or means to move out of the country or start your bill from somewhere no, else or like no, that. Not at all. I was very determined to succeed, uh, make my idea succeed. So I had no plan B. I was determined to get that money and I knew I would get it from somewhere. Okay. Ma'am. And now we have questions, two questions from the chat box. One is from Dr. Sri Nivashan Krishnamurti. The question is, can we create a fund corpus exclusive, exclusively by Indian industries to fund basic research by academia? I don't think that's a good idea because I think what you need to do, basic research has to be funded by government. Okay, What needs to be funded or what needs to happen is for that basic research to translate into an, an, an applied idea. And that applied idea can only happen if you have an industry academia linkage like I talked about, right? That's why you need a tech transfer office to keep on looking at these uh, uh, research ideas that can translate into an, uh, an applied idea or an industrial application. And that's what you need. You need, an, you need that business of science thinking. You need that business uh, development division within every research institute like Imtech, without which you can go on creating as many funds as you want and it will all be wasted. You should have an incubator though in Imtech. Thank you, ma'am, for your answer. So now we have one more question from the meeting, from the chat. Uh, it's from Sachin. He asked, how can we uh, break free academia research and its speed from financial constraints? No, I just think I have already shared my idea of how do you create those industry academia linkage. See, the industry academia linkage must happen because of a need, because of a compelling need. You cannot force it, right? You've heard it all this time that, you know, you know, academia doesn't understand what industry needs and academia says, oh, industry doesn't understand what we are doing as research and they are being very unimaginative. So until that linkage happens the way I'm saying to you, you, you cannot force anything. So I think you really need to make sure that industry invests in academic labs and research. And the way you have to do it is to give an incentive to industry to invest in your labs. And the moment you do that, and you don't even have to give grants or money, all that industry needs is a weighted tax deduction on the amount of in money it is investing in an academic lab to collaborate and do research. When you do that, you will create those industry linkages. Without that, it's not going to happen. You can create all the funds, you can create all the financial uh, models that you like, but look, until you create that, that virtuous cycle of ideas coming from academia, and those novel ideas coming from academia, which then industry then develops and shapes and takes to the market, you cannot do anything. And that's what has happened in the US. Today, every 
uh, academic research lab in the US is generating new ideas. And those ideas are constantly being scouted for by industry. So unless you guys come up with new ideas and not the old ideas, how can Imtech grow? Imtech has to grow with new research findings, new research ideas. You know, I told you there's a lot of scope in microbial technologies. OK, ma'am, thank you very much for your answer. So now we have one more question from uh, Seminar Hall Main Building. You can ask your question. Good afternoon, ma'am. This is Nalita Sharma, this side. It was a very inspiring talk. And I would just like to ask you that uh, you mentioned you uh, are the women entrepreneur in India and what challenges you face to become that. And uh, what do you think that how is that uh, it has changed and what is the future of uh, women scientists and researchers in India? I think things have changed hugely since I started my company. I started my company in 1978 when there were very few women researchers, very few business women. Uh, and I, as you know, uh, pioneered the biotech sector and I know I was all alone. Even today, I'm very often the only woman in, in, a, in, a, in a room of uh, men when it comes to uh, business forums or you know, those kind of uh, you know, settings. But having said that, uh, you know, I think today I've come to a stage where I'm one amongst equals, okay? I'm not considered to be a woman entrepreneur uh, in, in, in an unequal way. But to get to here, it's been a long journey. It has been a journey of uh, establishing credibility. I think women do need to fight for their place. I do think women have to build credibility in, in a much harder way than men have to be, uh, build it. But having said that, I think the, the opportunities for women today are much greater. There are many, many women empowerment schemes there. You know, the whole world is looking at gender equity. Uh, you know, a lot of the measures that have been taken today under ESG are helping women a lot. Uh, there are many women oriented, uh, you know, uh, schemes for financing uh, entrepreneurs for uh, uh, you know, even the kind of uh, policies that most companies have for their women employees are, are, are very good. So I think women today have a lot of things going for them and you must take advantage of it. I don't think now you can complain and grumble that, you know, women uh, have it very tough. I think it's up to us. We should not be diffident. We should take advantage of all that's being offered to us. And uh, of course, it is about building credibility and it takes time. Because, you know, not everybody accepts women in the way they should. But having said that, I think things are much better. I think there are a large number of women who have proved themselves. I think there's a lot of respect for women leaders, not both politically and in the business world. So I just think women need to be far more confident and uh, far more, uh, you know, uh, self-confident, I would say. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Now we have one more question from Dr. Hemraj Nandanwar from CSRM. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Hemraj. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Kiran. Uh, you told about this. Uh, 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 the uh, government should give a tax rebate if you invest uh, for uh, Indian uh, R&D. So what, what is about this corporate social responsibility fund? And also I would like to know uh, because you know Imtech from long time and uh, sometimes we were our research council member also long back. So what is the take home message? What kind of research should uh, Imtech do uh, based on this? See, it is not for me to tell you what kind of research you should do. I think uh, microbial technologies are I've got a huge opportunity. I think if you're a researcher, you should know what uh, you want to do. I think it's about the curiosity of, of, of knowledge. I mean, every researcher has to be curious about knowledge, about, about creating new knowledge, about 
you know, learning from old knowledge and saying, how do you create new knowledge? It is not for me to tell you what you should do, because if you are asking me what should you research, you're not a researcher. I'm sorry. I think research is about your own curiosity, and that's how it happens in all research labs. You know, so please understand that I am not here to prescribe what you should be researching. If you have a idea, if you have a, you know, a, a curiosity of challenging the status quo and discovering new things, believe me, what research you do and which what and what you discover in the process will be very valuable compared to if you're being told, please do this or please do that. And what is about the CSR fund uh, to divert? Look, uh, CSR fund is being used extensively in many, many institutes. OK, but I don't think there's such a huge outcome coming out of it. I think CSR fund today, the way it's being used effectively is creating incubators. OK, is creating, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, men, of course, CSR funding is also going into interesting research that's being pursued, like in Bangalore, I know that we are actually, uh, you know, a lot of CSR money is going into creating new uh, research centers, like, for instance, the Brain Research Center, uh, you know, bioengineering departments, where there are people who are leading it. So it's all about people who are leading these research efforts. When they come and ask, uh, they want uh, money to be invested in some new area, I think there's a lot of CSR available. But if you're just saying, please give us some money for what? That kind of CSR will not come into an institute just to support an institute. It has to back an idea. It has to back some new research area. That's the way money is uh, going into institutes. So if, you have a great, if you have a great new area of research where you want uh, CSR money to flow, then that is what your, you know, your, your business development or your tech transfer office or whoever should be going and talking to people saying this is what we're trying to do. This is the new area of research and we are looking for CSR funding and you'll get it. OK, thank you, ma'am. Now the next question we have is from Dr. Charu Sharma. Ma'am, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, very good afternoon, Dr. Kiran. This is Dr. Charu Sharma. Uh, I have a very different question to you. Although um, you are very successful and you are a role model for, I think, most of us, but I just want to know any remorse you have in your life which you want to share through which we can learn as a female uh, scientist. Like you wish that you could have done something differently or something which you feel that you are still missing in your life. No, I don't think you should look at life like that. I think, you know, I get very uh, uh, energized by taking on challenges. So, you know, when I look at a challenge, I find that overcoming that challenge gives me a tremendous sense of achievement. So I don't shy away from challenges. And I don't think I would have done anything differently. OK, the only thing I think uh, uh, which I'm doing differently today is using digital technologies and that itself is very exciting you know the use of digital technologies to do many of the things that we're doing or which we used to do in a different way in the past can accelerate the process so i'm learning a lot about new digital technologies and for me it's a lifelong learning i don't think you want to wish yourself i mean i don't think you can look back and say should i have done something differently i think you should just look positively and forwards and see how can I do something better? OK, thank you, ma'am. I think we don't have more questions, ma'am. So. OK, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. It was very nice talking to you. We thank you and all the best. And I hope all of you will really come up with some really interesting ideas because it all starts with an idea. And given the fact that you're all in a, in an institute that has this huge potential of coming up with terrific research ideas, I really hope I see a lot coming out of IMTEC. And, uh, you know, Dr. Khosla, I wish you all the best. I'm sure you will, uh, you know, take on board many of the things I've said. 
about creating an incubator, creating a tech transfer office, focusing on patenting. And I'm sure that Imtech will start, uh, you know, trailing, uh, blaze trailing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mujumdar. And uh, some of the ideas we are trying to implement, and uh, I'm sure if you are able to come over here in the next few months or the, whenever it is possible, we would be able to actually showcase what we have to give yeah. to the society. Yeah. That, that Absolutely. And also, I invite you to come with uh, small groups to visit us as well. Sure. Definitely. Yeah. That will be great. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much.